Picture your favorite fictional vision of the future. What do you see? I've seen things you people wouldn't believe. Chances are that image is of a dystopia, perhaps The Handmaid's Tale or Black Mirror, Blade Runner, Mad Max, or my favorite at the moment, Years and Years. But just as our reality has seemed to take a dystopian turn, there's been a resurgence of political imagination as utopian dreams have returned to the forefront of our politics. I'm an unashamed utopian thinker. So this week I want to talk about fully automated luxury communism. We are going to transition this country into the future and we are not going to be dragged behind by our past. From the Green New Deal and fully automated luxury communism on the left, to the strongman rule of Trump's America or the buccaneering spirit of Brexit Britain on the right, there's no shortage of radical visions of our political future. But one person's dream can be another's nightmare. The essence of the American character is to explore new horizons and to tame new frontiers. We are going to have the Air Force and we are going to have the Space Force. How achievable are these utopias, especially when they collide with the realities of power and government and events? And what can we learn from past attempts to turn dreams into reality. You're listening to Polarized, the podcast from the RSA that's all about the big divides in our politics and culture. I'm Matthew Taylor. Coming up this week, I'll be speaking one of the leading thinkers on the history of utopian and dystopian thinking, Professor Gregory Clays, and to James Meadway, former economic policy advisor to Shadow Chancellor John McDonnell. But first, if you listened to our previous episode, you'll have heard some of my conversation with Paul Mason, who describes his new book, Clear, Bright Future, as a work of radical optimism and belief in the human being. In our full disclosure segment this week, I want to play you a bit more of our discussion where I expressed some of my doubts about utopianism. The the urgent thing is to leave behind one no and many yeses. The idea that we've got an opposition to something, but no proposal of our own. The centre's utopia has kind of died. The right's utopia is clear. The left must have its utopia. I'm an unashamed utopian thinker. For, with all the dangers that raises, and all the, all, you know, 101 sociology tells you, you know, utopian thinking leads to the Gulag and the Holocaust and Hiroshima. And if you're really lucky, it will also throw in uh, the, the genocide of um, the indigenous people in Australia and Latin America. Uh, but... It do, yes, it did do, and we need to learn from that. But the right has a utopia. It's a battle of utopias. If we don't have one, if we don't have the idea of a good society and how we're going to get there... Yeah, but that, in a sense, that's not the, 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 the point I'm trying to get to. The point I'm trying to get to is that the, the, the road to hell is paved with good intentions yes. in the sense that yeah. the, kind of no, the utopian notion that if we can create the right society, everybody will be in a state of bliss, well. right? Uh, I don't think I say that. No, well, no, no, but you don't. It, but you are a utopia. You do argue that there can be a state of society in which human beings will have the good life. And in a sense, implicitly in that, that, that all the kind of travails and miseries and contradictions, I'm, you know, I'm, a, bit of, I'm a bit with Freud in some mm. of, you know, the, the fact that parts of our personality systematically attack each other. That, that kind of, that in some way this will go. And what worries me about that is that I think one of the roots to totalitarianism is that, is, that, is that radicals create societies and they expect people to be happy. When people aren't happy, they turn on yeah. the people who aren't happy and say, yeah. right, you yeah. bastards, I'm going to make you happy, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah? That, and, that, that, and that is a root. Yeah. That, that is a that, root. So that, what worries me slightly is because in your utopia, I worry that you're, I'm not going to be allowed to be the miserable git that I am. No, well, I, I, I think should, 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 I might write a little instruction to any of my minions in 100 years' <laughs> Time. We've read this book and become a cult around Paul Mason. Let him off. <laughs> Paul's not the only person publishing new works of utopian thinking. Aaron Bastani from the left wing media organisation Novara has just published a book outlining what he calls fully automated luxury communism. And the BBC is said to be commissioning a new genre of TV drama, Hope Punk, aimed at millennial viewers looking for optimistic escapism in an era of political and ecological crisis. 
So this is not just a political phenomenon, but a cultural one too. Gregory Clays is a professor of the history of political thought at Royal Holloway University of London. Welcome, Greg. Thank you. And as I mentioned, I'm also joined by James Meadway, the former economic advisor to Shadow Chancellor John McDonnell, who's currently working on a book about economics for the many. Welcome, James. Hello. How's the book going? Uh, Badly, badly. Uh, I'm not a good person to talk about (laughs) utopias to at the minute because of this. Very good. I know what it's like. Um, Greg, uh, I saw you shaking your head uh, as you listened to the conversation I had with Paul and the suggestion that utopian thinking kind of inexorably uh, kind of facilitates totalitarianism and oppression. So you don't, you don't, I don't think you like that idea. So let's start with you shaking your head. <clears throat> Invariably, it's the case that you have to refer back to the catastrophes of the 20th century. The dystopias of the right, Hitler, obviously those of the left, Stalin, Pol Pot, and so on, don't disprove the utopian hypothesis that the world can be made dramatically better. But they certainly do uh, offer a jarring effect for considering that one particular type of utopia is likely to be successful, namely the variant on Marxism-Leninism, which led to those two particular dystopias, and Mao, of course, as well. Uh, So I'd reject resoundingly the idea that people can come together to share a stronger sense of common interest, that they can live on terms of relative social equality, that they can live with perhaps not communism, but a degree of the sharing of property, which includes a much larger public component than we, for example, have in Britain today. These are also utopian experiments, after all. If we go back to the prehistory of the modern conception, we think of people like Charles Fourier in France, of Robert Owen in Britain. Small-scale communitarian experimentation, which of course has a long prehistory of its own, the Christian communal movements, the monasticism of the Middle Ages, and so on, projected into the nation-state form by Thomas More, famously in 1516, the text which gives Mm -hmm. us the name of uh, this way of thinking. Many of these forms of experimentation are quite successful. So I think uh, a theme in your books, and you've written extensively about both utopia and dystopia, is that I think you want to put at the heart of it the question of, of collectivism, really, that dystopia comes from a kind of sense of division, fundamental division and threat from uh, others and outside and threat of oppression. And utopia is around a kind of, well, a a human, at the heart of it is some notion of human community. Is that right? I take both utopia and dystopia to be variants on group psychology. This is my principal point of entry into the subject. Uh, And I think for this reason, the two terms are not polar opposites. There is a spectrum of activity whereby we can describe dystopia as an extreme form of collectivism where the individual is sacrificed for the common good, the common interest, the larger group, and nothing is left of own life, as Orwell put it. On the other hand, utopia is still uh, geared very much towards an increase in sociability by comparison with the society against which it emerges and against which it's written. So, but the sacrifice of the individual is not supposed to be as great there. When we think of utopia as the good society in the modern period, certainly since H.G. Wells, we think of the preservation of individuality as one of the key accomplishments of the modern period from the Renaissance, early modern period onwards. And we think that if we're going to have utopia, it cannot be of the extreme collectivist type. Uh, It has to somehow square the circle preserve those valuable rights that we describe as belonging to the individual, preserve the sphere of individuality, which we regard quite rightly as kind of the core of the liberal worldview, but yet at the same time, give us a sufficient purchase on our collective needs and our collective and common interest that we don't see the sacrifice of that to extreme individualism. Um, James, I'm going to bring you yeah. in properly in a few minutes, but I'm really interested in how, you, how you're responding to kind of Greg's account of, of, of what's at the core of utopian thinking. Well, the core of utopian thinking is, is a sort of vision of, of what you need to aim to. The thing that, that, that sticks out is, is that you, you, do, do, how much of this actually sounds like utopia? 
right? If you say, could things be a bit better and can we work collectively to make things a bit better, then that, that doesn't sound like a particularly uh, a big utopian demand. And this is this is the sort of the odd thing about political imagination. You know, if you, if you take um, take Labour's 2017 manifesto, it's not a utopian document in any uh, any reasonable stretch of imagination. It, it's it's fairly sort of pragmatic list of things you could do, some stuff in public ownership, increased spending a, a bit on healthcare, that sort of thing. Not, nothing in there seems utopian, but it gets treated by chunks of the media and this sort of thing as, as if this is a uh, wild crazy dangerous radicalism that this is you know as you mentioned that the road to hell being paved with good intentions that this is you know the literal expression of you know hayek's road to serfdom or something like this presented uh, in document form and, and, it, and it's just odd that, that we've ended up with this imagination political imagination that's so cramped that basically saying let's have something like a north european social democracy is treated as wild utopianism and therefore dangerous radicalism rather than the fairly pragmatic sensible document it is. But but when I'm attacked by people on Twitter for my Blairite past, they often refer to me as a reformist. And so it isn't contained within this when you look at it through a political lens, mm-hmm. the distinction between a, a reformist and a revolutionary. And, and OK, you might want to get to your revolution through steps rather than at one great leap. But nevertheless, what you were envisaging is a fundamentally reformed society. But doesn't anybody who sets out to change society envisage something like that? I mean, you feel like if you want a, a really sort of utopian vision uh, of the future, and Blair and Brown had this, certainly before they, they go into office, they start talking about, in fact, Blair carried on doing this in office, I think it's fair to say. He talks about the, the possibilities of what globalisation can deliver, this new world that's being created that we can't really stop, but it could be really good and we can all be a part of it. Now, that, that to me seems profoundly utopian in the sense of what does globalisation actually do? I mean, 15 years later or 20 years later, we can see some, some of the after effects of this. So, so that feels like a much more utopian way of looking at the world than a sort of pragmatic assessment of where capitalism is and what we could do, what we could do about it instead. So that begs the question, Greg, which you must get asked all the time, which is what is the, what, what is the dividing line between a mere aspiration and a utopia? Well, let me reverse the terms of this to some degree. I think we have to interject a very serious contemporary note at this point in the conversation and ask where we're actually going practically and then ask whether the whole range of proposals before us, some of which we've described as reformist, others as revolutionary, utopian, actually match up to the historical reality we face. We are hurtling at high speed on a road which goes off the end of a cliff. The music is playing loudly and we're drinking champagne and not very far into the future, we're going to go over that cliff. You know, of course, what I'm talking about here. Catastrophic environmental breakdown. It's the single greatest challenge ever uh, facing humanity. Uh, The odds of us surviving it are actually practically not very good, it has to be said. Uh, The latest prognosis, you're well aware of the narrative of the last 30 years or so, of 1.5 to 2 degrees Celsius, so-called global Mm. warming, uh, acceptable limits of climate change. Within the last three years, we've seen the likely temperature rise by the middle of the century rise to some four degrees, once regarded as a catastrophic scenario. So you, are you saying, Greg, this is the time to get rid of utopias and because utopias distract us from no, the fact that... Of, no, no, I'm not. I'm not. Uh, or do, does utopia help us because it helps us to imagine a kind of post-carbon future, for example, to reimagine how our lives would be radi- could, could be radically better in a world that isn't oriented to traditional models of growth, for example. Exactly. Uh, You can either despair, which is relatively easily done in these circumstances, particularly if you followed this debate closely in the last two years. The poles are going with with just over one degree Celsius. The poles are melting, all the glaciers are melting, desertification, aridification, water shortage, vast population movements and so on already happening and projected to happen in a much worse scale by only 10 years from now. So is utopia then completely dead? We've faced this Mm. catastrophic dystopia and a pessimist would say it's not soluble, really. We're not doing very much. Now, let's just consider Greta Thunberg and Extinction Rebellion. Let's consider that a few people are now willing to go out in the streets and get themselves arrested in order to press home the gravity of the problem. There lies in that, although Thunberg herself has said, look, 
um, the metaphor she wants to use is our house is on fire. I don't want you to hope. I want you mm. to panic. I want you to feel absolutely desperate about the circumstance we face. I think she's right about this. The fact she has inspired and the school strike movement and XR in turn in the last eight months now, nine months, has inspired such a powerful response, of course, leads us to feel much more hopeful that there might be an agency of contributing to the changes we need. And that, of course, doesn't define the utopia. It doesn't define the changes. To my mind, we require slamming the brakes on before we go over the cliff. We require a reversal. But that sounds, sorry, Gretchen Trump, but yeah. that sounds more like idealism than utopia. For me, the, the, the notion of utopia is that we have some kind of vision, which is in some ways got, you know, some elements, some detail to it, some, it's vivid account of uh, of what the future might be. And, I, and, and I'm not in any way questioning the emphasis you're putting here on the issue of climate. We've talked a lot about that in the program. But what about, let, let's introduce something which which is a really important theme, which is technology, because a characteristic of the modern utopias of the left and also of the kind of uh, Silicon Valley variety is the role that technology plays. And of course, that was at the heart of Paul Mason's book. Um, James, what, where do you, where do you, I mean, talk to us about this, this movement on the left around the enthusiasm for the possibility that technology provides an opportunity for great leap forward, as well as for addressing something concrete like climate change. Well, there's this, I mean, uh, Aaron's um, book, um, Fully Automated Luxury Communism, which I think started out as a sort of joke slogan. He's now sort of turned into an actual, uh, you know, something you might might want to talk about. What, what was interesting about it is that it gets out of um, something the left has been doing for, for quite some period of time, the, the Nick uh, Cernick and Alex Williams called folk politics, the idea that everything has to be necessarily small scale. Technology is sort of necessarily quite bad and a bit to be uh, uh, suspicious of. And that if we want any prospects for change, everything is reduced to the, the lowest sort of common denominator grassroots movements and that sort of thing. So so he does at least pose some really big questions about what why, might we do instead? What do we have to do instead if we want to do anything about climate change? And what could we do instead to make a world look like this? So I think it's good to pose the big questions with technology. The, the issue that, that starts to, to come through, I think, in, in the case of, of Aaron talking about these things, and, and I think you know, there's a few other people, maybe Paul Mason to, to some extent as well, is the, the, the issue of determinism. That is, Okay, you, you can have your version of utopia. There is something better you can get to here. And then you kind of cough a bit and wave your hands around and say, but the technology kind of gets you there without necessarily uh, going through the, the political steps that you need to get there. Now, Aaron, I think in fairness, does try and join this up. So does Paul. But you can see in his account of Technology, I think there's there's a there's a you, you start to lose some of the downsides of what technology looks like. The technology that we have is formed by a capitalist society that we live in. Uh, the data that we are creating that could be part of helping build a, a new society. Uh, take something like the NHS. I mean, it's incredible treasure trove of data that you can give to artificial intelligence and get it doing wonderful things with, with diagnostics very very rapidly. Or it could be massive privatization of incredible personal data that goes to uh, large corporations and they take it. And that's uh, just another form of, you know, alienation uh, and exploitation and all the rest of it. So, so you can sort of see how this technology could be used either way. The technologies that we actually have were developed in a society that works. In but a that's exactly way. the point, isn't it? Which is, which, 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 turning to you, Greg, which is that, that what we have with technology is that technology provides us with a very ready route to both dystopia and utopia. So we, we have a world that is controlled by Mark Zuckerberg of surveillance capitalism, you know, no jobs, uh, a super elite... Uh, and the rest of us living in a kind of Blade Runner urban situation. And then you've got Bastani and others talking about, you know, a world of, le- you know, sounding like Keynes or Marx talking about a world beyond work, a world of leisure, mm. a world of... So technology it, it really inhabits both of these worlds. So I'm interested, Greg, historically, w- what role has technology played in utopian and dystopian vision? I mean, obviously, for Wells, it was a big part of it. Yeah, I mean, the crucial moment for most people on the left today would be Marx's writing on machinery, particularly in the Grundrisse, uh, and the image which Wells, of course, picks up on and develops more uh, adeptly than any other writer in the modern period. I mean, he's just phenomenally successful. The image that eventually there will be a society where machinery does all the drudgery. The traditional utopian scenario hadn't been modern-facing because, of course, the technology wasn't there for this to happen. Mm. 
So right. if you wanted a happy group of people, let's say a few thousand people living in the countryside, you wouldn't want a great deal of machinery. So the early technologies were about government, weren't they? They were about the better way of ordering human affairs rather than technology solving our problems. You know, if you think about Plato or Moore or whatever. Even up to the middle of the 19th century, it's very rarely the case that we have a technologically okay. founded utopian vision. From the end of the 19th century onwards, almost all of them are. And all of this uh, modern writing, uh, Bastani and so on, essentially builds on the idea that the introduction of higher and higher, more and more sophisticated levels of technology will relieve humanity from its uh, burden of labor. To go back to where I started here, however, this is not the answer to the question of catastrophic environmental breakdown. This is the answer to the question, why is capitalism such a rotten system? And what should we do about it? And the classic response that Marx gives, of course, is to abolish alienation. We now have a very different angle of argument in which the same logic holds, that is to say, Capitalism is still a very bad system, but it's a bad system now not primarily because of exploitation, but because it's destroying the planet and all human life with it. So the logic of the old left, which I see flowing into a lot of these arguments, of needing to abolish capitalism still very much holds, but the rationale is very different. So, so James, for me, part of the notion of utopia, which is both upside and downside, is the notion that human beings will be better and 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 I, I want you. To, you know, I'm interested in 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 your view of that as someone on the left. Do you believe that with a radical Labour government, say it's in power for twenty years, doing you know some of the really kind of quite utopian things that John McDonald talks about, four day weeks, universal mm-hmm. basic incomes, inclusive ownership, you know, the radical policies. Yeah. Do we end up with? Do we end up with with you and me being? better people in some deep sense? Or are we just the same as we always were, but, but, but now we're reinforced positively all the time rather than negatively? No, I, I think the latter. I, I don't think the, the, the idea that we're all going to end up being better people, I think, is, um, well, if it happens or not, then a functioning utopia can't be one that depends on it happening, I think, I think is the important sort of political point here, is that if we, if we say, how do we get to a better world? Well, if only everybody was nice, then this isn't really a, a particularly useful sort of political statement because it deals with, you know, the, the way the world is structured is not because people are nasty necessarily. I mean, they can be in lots of different ways, but there are structures, there are institutions that produce behaviour like this that lead to exploitation alienation, environmental destruction, all, all that sort of thing. So, so I think part of this is, is and part of what's, what's where it gets more interesting, where you get out of, I suppose you might say, and this might be unfair, but uh, a kind of utopian discussion of what would the world look like when you get into a more political discussion, which is what are the structures that we need to get there and how can we change those structures? Then it becomes, I think, uh, a more interesting sort of, sort of prospect. I mean, take something like the four-day week. Um, th- this is, yes, it's a demand that, that's gaining some traction. There are some companies that, that are introducing it. Um, that it's not unreasonable to say that after, what, 60, 70 years of a five-day week, the shift from a six-day to a five-day week happened in the sort of 20s and 30s in the main. Uh, it's not unreasonable to suggest that after all this period of time, with all the extra productivity that we've got, we could in fact get to a four-day week. And, and it feels like something that's simultaneously quite easy to see what that might look like. You could say to someone, you will have a three-day weekend and they'll get the idea, they'll know what that is. So it's quite a concrete, definite, it's not like some wild vision of the future. But at the same time, it's kind of hardwired into a lot of people that we can't possibly do this because you know the world isn't really like that. So how you get from one point to the other, how you tap into the fact that this is a popular demand. If you go out and poll on it, you can see people think, yeah, I'd like a three-day weekend. What holds them back is thinking, well, we can't do it because you know, we can't, because companies will go bust, it'll all be too expensive, whatever. We, we have to crack through that, and that will involve changing institutions and the rest of it. We've got... Um, I've forgotten his name, Robert Skidelsky, biographer of Keynes, who you know famously wanted everyone to to, to you know, work fifteen hours a day. I think it was in, in fifty years writing in the nineteen nineteen thirties. Uh, Robert Skidelsky, right, who's written a lot about you know reductions in working time. Um, the question that I think he's going to be looking at is not just that what do we do, and this gets back to your point, what do we do with this sort of extra free time? And maybe we just sit around our backsides, you know, playing uh, PlayStation or whatever. If people want to do that, fair enough. But here, the question he poses is, we would need a, a different public realm. We'd need people, you know, we'd need the capacity to have more access to parks, to more access to creative things, because otherwise you've got, you know, just a lot of people with a lot of free time. So what are we going to do? It starts to unpack a whole vision, I think, of, of, of a wider society. So let, let's look at the question of, of social justice or equality. Sure. I mean, uh, Greg, is it a largely an assumption of the utopias of utopias that these are egalitarian societies. Is that a, is that a common theme? I mean, it wasn't of Plato's utopia, but quite the reverse. 
But but where does where does the notion of, of social where does the notion of equality or inequality f- tend to figure in utopian visions? There's usually some form of hierarchy in most utopias from Plato to middle or late nineteenth century, often based on age. Think of Thomas More's Utopia right. again, the elder basically ruling the younger. This is regarded as the most natural principle, but it's one of course which we later moderns by and large reject because we don't respect the aged and the uh, senior uh, in the way that we traditionally have for uh, most of the history of the human species. So there's an assumption in utopias and that, 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 that there has to be some kind of hierarchy. Um, again, there's a here, James, this kind of division between socialists and anarchists mm. because socialists will argue that you, need a, that you need a state. You need a reasonably strong state. Then you need to have political authority. People are elected and those people will have authority over... Everybody else versus a kind of anarchist vision that would say, no, if there's the existence of any kind of authority structure where one person has more power than another person, then that 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 itself is inherently problematic. Well, and some of the, one of the things about the kind of Corbyn project, I think, is 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 it sometimes feel like quite a statist project. So in terms of this kind of talking of an ideal society, what do you think is at the heart of the kind of Corbyn view in terms of is it a vision of a, of a strong paternalistic uh, state bringing about social justice, or is it ultimately a vision of kind of devolving power to people? Well, it, it's the latter. I think. Um, I mean, both Jeremy personally and John personally are, are, are come from strongly decentralising uh, traditions in, in the labour movement. That's that's their kind of personal background. But it's also a way of um, attempting. There's a couple of things. Here. I mean, one of them, I think, is a, is a recognition that simply saying here is the government, it will solve things. It, it doesn't necessarily quite work. There's there's a moment of truth where the kind of new right criticisms of big state bureaucracies in the 60s, 70s, into the 80s did have a German truth. Like, you were dealing with bureaucracies that didn't work too well. Now, the fact you replace that with a, a bureaucracy also doesn't work too well, but it happens to be a private corporation rather than a public corporation it is a, a further problem with the whole thing. But there is something uh, to that. There is also something to the the sort of the deep distrust that, that we're up against the government, that if you say to people, you know, do, do you expect the government to do anything particularly well? You will find most people say, well, not really. Frankly, they'd like it if it happened. Happens. It's not really an integral part of, of how they're going to think about the world, which is quite a cramp on what you might think government can do in practice. If your political program is saying government's going to make everything great for you, you run into a wall of cynicism. So I think there's a sort of practical considerations there. The third one I think is the, the more interesting part is that, look, if, if we're serious about what, what, does, what does it mean to have socialism or we'll talk about being a socialist, I think there's a really important bit we have to get back to, which has got it's disappeared in this country and it disappears in lots of places, which is this centralising tradition of social democracy the kind of how are we going to have public ownership well it's going to be a big nationalised concern it's going to be a sort of Morrisonian uh, Herbert Morrison model you know you just have a big corporation it's a hierarchy we'll keep more or less nationalise all the coal mines in, in 1948 and, and put exactly the same people basically in charge of, of running the things keep everything the same but move into the public sector uh, I think there's a much more radical vision here that you can talk about GDH coal the guild socialists the institute workers control uh, going all the way back to the, the levelers and the diggers really that you start to get into something that will make sense in the conditions we're in politically today, which is that decentralised tradition, which also has consequences for if we are trying to decarbonise our economy. I think the only way you're going to do this uh, is through some form of consent, that if you have something like, well, take the Gilets Jaunes uh, protests in France, you know, this is a big centralised attempt to whack up uh, taxes on, on motor vehicles, allegedly in the name of, of decarbonisation, runs into huge problems, runs into, runs into huge protests. If you don't have consent, decarbonisation isn't going to be possible. If you want consent, you need to give people some form of ownership over what you're doing. Ownership, for example, over renewable energy production is a really fast way to get what is now the very, very cheap onshore wind we could be using to power electricity in this country, to get it into uh, into the whole system and to, to have forms of, of local and community ownership. That isn't the same as the old model of state ownership and the old model of public ownership. So, so this is a kind of, it seems to me, is an interesting way of addressing the concerns I expressed at the outset into Paul Mason about utopia. So a utopia that is a self-governing utopia feels less frightening to me because it might not get everything right, but uh, it, 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 it vests the power in the people. But m- my sense of utopias, and again, Greg, I absolutely bow to your superior knowledge here, is that maybe because, certainly some of my literary utopias, maybe because writers tend to despise politicians, that, that politics doesn't play a very big role in a lot of Utopias. It, it is the rule of the wise or the elderly or, uh, or, or technology or whatever. 
are, are, does politics feature in utopias or, or is there a kind of assumption the whole point about utopias they don't need politics anymore? Well, it was a stock in trade late 19th century assumption, I think, shared by anarchists and socialists alike, that politics in the traditional sense of the word would disappear with the state. Marx thought so, William Morris thought so, Kropotkin, Bakunin, and so on agree entirely. Uh, whether this is a viable assumption now, I would challenge. I think uh, if we had a century to fix the environmental problem in particular. We could do this relatively gradually and we could ask for maximum consent and do it relatively gently. We don't. We have maybe 10 years, maybe a couple beyond that. Uh, we need consent. This does have to be done democratically. I'm not an echo fascist or anything uh, like that. And I don't think uh, extreme authoritarianism is going to work in this case. But there will be, of course, some who are harmed by the decarbonization process in particular, which is the very first step we have to take. People who are running coal mines, people who work in coal mines, people who own coal mines are going to be, ought to be, out of a job tomorrow. It has to be done very quickly. We have to start the conversation and then just do it. In order to compensate them, clearly, we have to have, um, in my view, this is going to require massive state intervention mm. and indeed massive international intervention, which is why leaving the EU, if I may say so, is such a bad idea at this particular point. So, so let me pick you up on that, Greg, because that, that's really interesting. Because, it, it, James, you, you've, you've given this account of... You know, Corbyn and McDonald's commitment to decentralizing yeah. power, to notions of self-government. Uh, the reality is, with a radical agenda, they could come in and they could find, a, a, you know, a, a strike of capital, for example. Mm -hmm. They could see the business community refusing to participate, uh, threatening to leave the country, find themselves very quickly in a position, whether it's Greg's agenda on decarbonization, which, you know, I absolutely recognize the importance of that, or it's the need to rein back a kind of capitalist class that's refusing to consent to a highly redistributive agenda or to the rationalization of, of the water companies or whatever it might be. They might be compelled pretty quickly to start to use rather authoritarian means, mightn't they? No, I don't think so. I think the, the entire sort of strategy here is, is, is predicated on that, on that not happening, and, and I don't see any reason why it would. The, the issue of, of this kind of thing about, oh, here's a capitalist class, and they'll get together and, and like plot against the government that they don't want to see uh, doing all these tremendous radical things. I mean, this is, you know, quote Marx, it's a band of warring brothers at, at best that, that you'll find that there are divisions, there's alternative views of what might happen, there's alternative prospects for the future, that there will be individuals with personal views about how more or less, you know, redistributive a, a country should be. There'll be all sorts of uh, a multiplicity of, of different ways of, of dealing and thinking about what society should do. And I think it's important on the Labour side for us to say, look, uh, and this has been the approach right from the start, is to say as transparently as possible, this is what we want to do. Um, you'll like some of it. You probably, frankly, if you're, if you're minded, you know, if you're running a pension fund or something, you're going to like big investment programs in lots and lots of uh, sort of new infrastructure of various sorts, precisely to get that uh, decarbonisation going and, and rebuild the country uh, outside of London and the South East. Like, you'll think that's not too bad. You're probably not going to like so much the fact you're going to have to pay a bit more tax if, if you're here in Britain. So that, that you know, there's going to be a balance uh, of how you do this. But what's clear to me is that as long as you're transparent about this, and this is a question of how power works and what you expect to do, it's why any talk about, you know, there's a secret plan B somewhere is absolutely it's just nonsense. It can't possibly happen. It's not how the civil service works. It's not how society works. It, it can't be a thing. That as long as we're transparent about what we want to do, then we can deal with the fact that there'll be variations in opinions about uh, how that can happen. But that's a shift, isn't it? Because the 2017 manifesto, you talked about that, that was a kind of retail manifesto. I mean, yeah, that, that was a manifesto that bought off pensioners with this promise and students with that promise and, you know, tenants with that, that promise. I'm not, I'm not saying any of those individual policies were right. I didn't agree with all of them. But, you know, it, it it wasn't actually very utopian. It was a pretty kind of straightforward vote for us and you'll get goodies. Uh, uh, do you think that the next manifesto has to be, on the one hand, more radical and on the other hand, more honest about the fact that this will involve struggle, that this isn't going to be a Labour government's going to arrive and the student fees will go and the pensions will go up and, you know, we'll have collective bargaining overnight. But this is going to be a, a struggle. And as you say, that, that, that this needs to be a project where people recognise if they're not participating in it, if they're not helping to make it happen... It doesn't matter how radical the government is, it probably isn't going to succeed. Well, I mean, take tuition fees. It, it's not... You, know, you can you can sort of look at these things in either way around. I mean, it's, it's odd to say you're, you're buying off students with tu uh, buying off students with tuition fees, partly because it, it doesn't directly affect most of them. But it's um, 
if you say tuition fees, the good thing about going, we're going to make university education free, is that it does contain that little germ of a utopian vision. That if you say you're going to do this, what it says in really small, neat form, it says to everyone what kind of government you are and what your priorities are and what kind of world you're, you're, you, you want to create. That you're going to take something, which at the minute is hugely expensive for people, involves getting into a, basically a lifetime of debt. Frankly, it's not financially sustainable to, to run this system, but that's one that's going to you know, come bearing down as in a few years' time, I suppose, that you change this system and you take something you used to have to pay for and you say it's free. You decommodify it, which, which by the way, I think is, is one of the important elements of what it might mean to be in the left uh, the, uh, at this point in time, that you want to get to the point where you're making stuff free, that you're saying all these things you used to have to pay for, we don't have to pay for anymore, which is why some of the interest around universal basic services uh, is so important. And the fact matter, UBI is so important. If you want to decommodify time, giving people some money so they have their time back I think is, is, is an important part of that. But it gave you a little germ of what the society might look like and what this government might be. So I think it was more than just a retail offer at that point. That's really interesting. So so we're kind of drawing to a close and, and you've, you've started to do it, James, but I'll come back to you again in a minute. But but Greg, if I was to put you on the spot, but if I was to ask you to capture one or two or three ideas utopian ideas, ideas you would like people to imagine are possible, things that you would like them to believe that they can do in the way that James has just described, which fires our imagination and then starts us to think about, well, what else, what would we have to do to make that possible? What would be the kind of couple of things you would like, you know, you and I were both older people, particularly younger people, to believe is possible? Well, we have to understand the first priority is preserving the planet we live on. Right. So sustainability is so the, they have to believe we can solve that problem. It's the primary okay. goal. Everything else is secondary, including the problem of inequality, although it is deeply interwoven with bringing in a wholly sustainable economy. So once you acknowledge that, then it is possible to offer a vision which is quite attractive, I think. It is not just free education. It's free public transport. It is the complete redesigning of cities to make them places where especially new spaces are created for sociability, to give people a sense of compensation for what, crucially, they will be giving up, which is consumerism. This is a post-consumerist vision. And what worries me most about the kind of long-term discussion, both with liberals and those on the left, including uh, people in the Labour Party, is that both ideals are wedded to a notion of progress, which is seen in terms of relatively unlimited production, distribution, and consumption of resources, and expanding population. This is the paradigm which Ricardo, Smith, and Marx all share in common. We have to get away from that. In other words, by ceasing to adhere to this, we need an entirely new paradigm. To make this attractive to young people, you have to show them that there's some compensation or they will despair. So, so you have to provide them with an image of a society which they would subscribe to and which they would believe is superior to the state in which they find themselves now with all the precarity, with the rise in property prices, with the uh, uh, very sadly declining state of the mental health of the young. So if you I promise them a future which can overcome those difficulties, they have something to So I get that completely. But this then takes me, James, to a question which you must have thought about deeply, which is the very first thing that will confront a Labour government getting to power is we need more money for social care, we need more money for education, we need more money for the NHS, and all of these things, we need more money for local government, we need more money for the police. Every single one of those demands has been articulated, by the way, by Labour shadow spokespeople. The only way we can currently get more money is through growing the economy and redistribution. And redistribution will not get us enough money to meet all those demands, however radical... Uh, that is. So how do you break out of the fact that the only way to generate the resources to meet the needs is, is conventional growth, which, as Greg says, is a dead end? What you'd say at that point, and, and, and I, I kind of I share the, the the sort of cynicism about GDP as a, as a, as a measure of, of society's progress or, or something that we should all aspire to, to lift or whatever. But if, if you're saying that okay, here is our let's say ten years to, to decarbonise, might have to be rather quicker than that if it's you know 2022 election or whatever. That will involve, in the first instance, fairly significant increase in GDP. 
not because you want that to happen, but because you are going to employ a load of people doing something different. So you're already reshaping uh, the economy at that point. Now, if you're talking about once you've got through that process, if you're if you're somewhere down the line, um, I think that's the point in which the the broader vision, if you like, of uh, a society which is decommodified, which has a much bigger sort of public sphere, a larger kind of common uh, space that people can enjoy, that is more collective production of, of the things we like doing, some of which people are doing anyway. I mean, there's, there's a great deal of kind of collective production taking place under capitalism, increasing amounts, actually. If you look at people churning out YouTube videos or contributing to Wikipedia or whatever, I mean, it's, it's relatively at the moment on the fringes, but you can start to bring that mode of producing uh, I- into the centre of society. Then you get to a vision of it. That's where I think things like the reductions in working time, which we know has a, a good impact, you know, fairly rapidly uh, on um, carbon uh, carbon impact and greenhouse gases and, and general environmental effects. We know it's positive for this, but it starts to tap into a vision of what that society might look like, where we're not sort of confined to simply a market form production the whole time and everything that this involves. They've actually got loads of stuff that's free and we're producing things collectively. And that, I think, starts to look like quite a bold appealing I can, vision. I, I, can, I can see that in the medium term, long term, sure. and, 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 it's, and it's compelling. I'm still not... I, I still don't know the way out of the conundrum, which well, is a Labour a a, a Labour government comes to power. The immediate yeah. priority in its first six months is to spend a shed load more yeah. money. It's under pressure from global markets. Uh, the, but, it we, has, we, but it, we know, look, we laid, we laid it out in 2017 that, that we can do this, right? We, we costed, fully costed all the current spending on, on the manifesto. This is getting into the, the technical details. We fully costed. No, but it is premised on every, growth, though. But it is no, premised on growth. No, it's not. It's not. Right. It's not. It's premised on, uh, the most it's premised on are the OBR's own forecasts for growth. So we're assuming that the economy will grow exactly as badly as the OBR was forecasting at the time, which is not much growth at all. So that is premised on, yes, we can get these extra taxes in, and we can argue up and down about how much tax you, you're going to be able to raise. But we're saying that's what we're going to raise. We also have, uh, a tight but significantly loose in the current government's fiscal settlement uh, that we call the fiscal credibility rule basically says we will set a target to remove the de- deficit in five years' time on a rolling basis and we will allow uh, a very great deal of capital investment. Now, put all that together, you can start to see how you fund some of the commitments. You can certainly fund all commitments in 2017, that, but what you I, can fund beyond that point. I can see that, but I don't see how that responds to Greg's point, which is that we have to fundamentally change the whole kind of logic of society in incredibly short order. Is that, isn't that right, Greg? And not by 2050 either. Yeah. No, I'd agree. Uh, yes. I mean, we should think at the very latest of the 10-year window that we've been presented now for the last couple of years. We go beyond that and we risk not being able to come back. Well, it's been an absolutely fascinating conversation, uh, both of you. Thank you very much. James, when's your book due out? Probably or? early next year. Probably, early. I know that kind of. I know that kind of. Probably <laughs> word as somebody's trying to write book myself. I know the feeling. And Greg, your wonderful book about utopias is coming out as a paperback. I understand. Yes, should be out in mid twenty twenty or so. And much of what I've spoken about today should be in the form of a book called Utopianism for a Dying Planet, which also I hope is out in twenty twenty. So it's a race between you to see who first publishes the book. But thank you both for joining me today. Thank, thank you. you. Well, I found that a fascinating conversation. It didn't really go where I thought it was going to go. Greg Clays really wanted to talk about the climate emergency more than anything else. In a sense, it seemed to me that he was saying, well, two things really. On the one hand, maybe we just have to forget utopias because we're in the in the face of a crisis. But maybe also to believe we can solve this crisis, we need a bit of utopianism. We need to imagine that we can utterly transform society because that is what is going to be necessary. James Meadway, who's you know writing a book and has supported John McDonnell and, and is a radical, wanted to kind of play down, it seemed to me, largely the idea of, of, of a kind of utopianism on the left. He wanted to argue that this is a very kind of practical, well-thought-through project, but but also that th- there are elements, he talked about the four-day week, which feel kind of more visionary. And I, I think that's a kind of interesting balance for the Corbyn project. Does it emphasize the kind of practicality and uh, uh, reassure people, or does it want to excite people with notions of universal basic incomes and four-day weeks and, and ideas like that? But in the end, I think we were left with this interesting tension And it is the tension between a traditional left of centre project, which will start with public spending, economic growth, 
redistribution, that traditional agenda which takes place within the assumptions of a normal economy, or given the momentum which is now building, particularly amongst young people, around issues around climate change, the sense of an emergency, an emergency which Jeremy Corbyn recently argued successfully to be recognised in the House of Commons, will we see a shift in Labour's rhetoric? Will Labour feel that it both has to, and indeed there is an opportunity for it, to move away from that conventional, rather economistic account of the left, which is we'll come into power, the economy will grow, we'll give you more money, we'll put more money into public services, and into a slightly more utopian idea that elect a Labour government, and we will, from the beginning, try to run society on the kind of very different basis it needs to be run if we are going to be able to save our planet. I think that's a really interesting dilemma for the Labour Party and its activists over the coming period. Well, thanks for listening. That's it for this episode of Polarise. Next time, Ian Leslie and I will be speaking to the senior BBC commissioner, Mohit Bakaya, about the BBC's efforts to be even-handed in this highly charged political climate. I hope you've enjoyed this episode. Please do tell someone about it. And we'd really appreciate it if you left us a rating or a review in your podcast app. I've been Matthew Taylor. The producer was James Shield. And we were brought to you by the RSA. (laughs) 